Welcome to the Interrupt. My guest today is Brian Crane. He is the president of the Foundation Council at the ICF and CEO of Course One. In today's conversation, we'll be talking about the staking economy, restaking, liquid staking, uh, also his role at the ICF and uh, the broader role of the ICF in the ecosystem moving forward. I'm also dying to find out why he thinks you should be taking all your notes in Obsidian and why you should be eating more steak. Before we get started, make sure to hit the like button, hit the notification get bell, and subscribe to get all my episodes. And remember that none of what we discuss here on The Interop is investment advice. And if you enjoy this content, please consider sticking with us. We're live on Avmos Quicksilver, Osmosis, Juno, and Nolis. Just look for Interop in the active set. My guest, Brian Crane, is coming up next, right here on The Interop. GM. Hey, hey, thanks so much for having me. It's great yeah. to, you know, do this podcast in another way with you. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, actually, it's, it's funny how like there, there's some people that listen to the Europe that, that have no idea that Epicenter exists. So, you know, for those of you who have not, uh, you know, captured that piece of information, you know, Brian and I have been hosting a podcast together for uh, almost 10 years uh since the the wee early days of crypto it's called epicenter you should check it out uh it's uh it's much broader than i think than than the interop in terms of the content we cover uh, also there's other hosts there including sunny agarwal and for they get ernst and sometimes felix from chorus but um yeah we, we've done this lots and lots and lots and lots of times but not in this uh, configuration where you know i'm interviewing you so yeah yeah me. cool yeah well thanks so much for having me I'm excited yeah to talk so, about lots of things <laughs> Yeah, there's lots to talk about, and you know, I, I wanted to get you on. Sort of, it was sort of on the heels of your uh, of the announcement that uh, you are now president of the Entertain Foundation Council, and you know, I thought that uh, it would be a good idea to to talk about the ICF and talk about your role there, how the ICF is, you know, has evolved over the years, and like the direction that the ICF will be going in the future. I think for a lot of folks in this space, there's maybe sometimes some confusion about the ICF and its role, etc. So like want to give you the opportunity to sort of like, you know, yeah, you know, make that clear for, for most people because I think it, it's it's helpful. Um, also want to talk about, yeah, a bunch of stuff related to staking since Chorus One is a uh, massive player in the staking uh, ecosystem. Um, but before that, I, I just want to like one small piece of housekeeping here for the audience. Uh, I've decided to no longer do these live. And, uh, you know, if you've been following this podcast for a while, you know that I, I typically record these live on Thursdays. And that's been really great. It's, it was a uh, really fun to do these podcasts live, but um, over time, I've realized that live streams come with a bunch of uh, well, it has have, have a lot of issues, and and mostly uh, you know some technical issues that can happen. Uh, also, sometimes like I'm traveling and I don't have time to do a live stream, and I'd like to stay consistent. So um, that and a whole bunch of other reasons uh, led me to like stop doing live streams. So these will now be recorded. Uh, and and release we'll still try to release them on thursday every week uh but just you won't be able to come in and you know be in the chat room might be do, might be do, doing some live streams in the future around like other kinds of content i think it'd be cool to do like a like a panel discussion maybe once a month and those could be live stream but at least the interviews will be pre-recorded and i hope that will help improve the quality but yeah with that out of the way um brian yeah uh please talk a little bit about your yeah your background um and for those who don't know you who have not been listening to epicenter who is Brian Crane? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, so I've been, uh, I, I got interested in crypto uh, 10 years ago, a bit over 10 years ago, 10 and a half years ago, uh, when I you know, learned about Bitcoin. And I was interested in entrepreneurship and building companies. So I had some interest in that and I wanted to do something there. And I was also interested in economics and game theory, which is mostly what I studied. And then I was also interested in, I think I had some sort of, uh, you know, proclivity to ideas of, you know, more decentralization, anarchy, more libertarian type of ideas. So I, I think just sort of the political vision that was with, I saw in Bitcoin was very appealing to me. So I, I kind of got into uh, crypto back then and it was immediately, okay, this is the thing that I want to focus on. Uh, I was always very, you know, I was never a maximalist of any kind. So, you know, new things came along, was very interested in it. 
I mean, we, we at Epicenter Center were always doing that, right? We would always, you know, do new episodes about whatever was the most interesting thing. And, you know, so I was immediately like getting into Ethereum too, in like beginning of 2014 and other things as well. And um, so then it happened that in 2015, the first time I kind of worked for a company uh, which was building enterprise Ethereum applications and which was one of the first companies doing that. And they were also building on, uh, they basically took the Ethereum and said like, hey, how can we make, you know, enterprise uh, versions of this? And so of course you wanted to replace proof of work with something else. And so that company became the first company to build on Tendermint. This was back in, you know, 2015, uh, 14, 15, I was there 15, 16. And uh, yeah, so it was kind of familiar with Tenement and, you know, this company was contributing to Tenement. And then um, actually one of the uh, other people who were working at the company was Ethan Buckman. Um, so he was an engineer at that company. And then Ethan left and he joined Jay and he, he kind of, you know, kind of co-founded Cosmos. And then I, I also left like uh, soon after and I, I joined uh, the company uh, you know, all in bits, Inc., or, you know, it was also often called Tendermint, uh, you know, which was uh, founded by Jay and co-founded by Bucky. And so I became like the COO of that in at the beginning of 2017. And then we did, uh, you know, the, the, the fundraiser. Uh, I guess that's where the ICF will also come in uh, in 2017. And, you know, I was working at that company uh, throughout 2017 until the beginning of 2018, you know, kind of helped you know, where, yeah, with the fundraiser, with kind of the initial phase of the Cosmos ecosystem, growing that organization too. So we grew that uh, that year from maybe five people at the start when I joined to around 40 people at the end of the year. And the organization was, you know, a big mess, but lots of great people were there and uh, who went on to do, you know, lots of interesting things. I mean, some examples are you know, Sonny was there, or Adrian Brink was there, you know, Chris Ghost joined soon later, you know, there was like Ismail from Celestia was there once, and uh, Ethan Buckman was there, and a lot, a lot of other people too, right, who would Fede. go, <laughs> Fede, we do Evmos, you know, Jack Sam, Jack. <laughs> Zaki yeah. was sort of, sort of there, right, I think he, he was not like a full-time team member, but he was still very involved as well, um, so, uh, yeah, so I was basically there and then I, there was a few things that caused me to leave. You know, one was, it was just a difficult environment in which to do productive work. It was also the case that there wasn't like that much, I didn't feel there was that much to do for somebody like me who was not a technical developer. And, you know, this was like after the money was there, the developers were hired, you know, they were basically working on building Cosmos to mainnet. And, uh, yeah, and we were just sort of waiting for this launch. And then at the same time, um, you know, it was very clear that proof of stake is coming. And I was very convinced that we would have many different proof of stake networks and that that was the future of how blockchains are secured. So um, at the same time, you know, there was no staking companies back then because there was no proof of stake networks that were alive. And so we were kind of like, well, we're writing all this software and writing these white papers and it talks about validators and, and staking, but like, who's actually a validator? Like, who's going to do this? And uh, so we were like, okay, let's work on this. Uh, and so I started this company together with Meher Roy, who, uh, you know, is also an Epicenter co-host, right? So, um, so we've kind of known each other on that end for, for a long time. And so, yeah, we started working on that. And uh, this, this was like at the start of 2018, really. So about five and a half years ago. And yeah, of course, one we've done, we've worked on, uh, you know, I would say we've had a bunch of kind of detours as well, where we kind of got a little distracted. And uh, but what throughout we've done is, you know, we've been working on staking infrastructure and uh, we were running infrastructure for, around you know almost 50 different protocols um you know i think have something around like 1 billion that's like being staked through course one at the moment and you know we work with like various different um you know various different types of customers you know from normal people staking to cosmos public nodes we run like white label nodes for some partners 
we work with custodians, uh, you know, wallets, like different types of, uh, you know, crypto products, institutions uh, on staking. And yeah, definitely, I would say if, if there's a bit of a focus for course one, I would say it's probably most at this point, uh, Ethereum and Cosmos. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, there's some other areas where we're pretty deeply involved. For example, MEV is an area where we've been doing lots of work in. Uh, I think that's, you know, turning into a bit of, um, you know, focus area for, for course one and like a differentiator for us. Um, but yeah, that's basically course one. Um, in Urbit, of course. Yeah. And then we, we also, I've also been pretty interested in Urbit for a while and gotten pretty involved in that. So we do have a team, uh, we have a product and team called Red Horizon. So you can check it out at redhorizon.com, which is building uh, Urbit infrastructure for Urbit, for hosting Urbit servers. So yeah, if anybody's interested in that, uh, it's all free at the moment. You can check it out at redhorizon.com and get you know, an Urbit, uh, Urbit planet that's hosted by us that you can like explore the Urbit ecosystem. So yeah, so that's that. And then I've, so yeah, so I've been involved in Cosmos basically since the beginning. And then I think we had in, this was like 2020. Yeah, it was, a, it was a bit over three years ago, but maybe three and a half years ago. Um, well, okay, may, maybe now let's talk a little bit about the ICF just for a minute to give some some context on that. So, so the ICF was, um, you know, ICF was set up when in the beginning of 2017 and the the Cosmos fundraiser, it was organized by the ICF. So basically, uh, people would donate, you know, Bitcoin or Ethereum, and then they would get, uh, you know, kind of written into this file that we were like, oh, this was going to be the Genesis distribution once Cosmos Hub launches. And, uh, and, and, and um, Bitcoin and Ethereum went to this Swiss foundation called the Interchain Foundation. And also 10% of the atoms went to that foundation as well. And there was not really any staff at the foundation at the time. Everyone is hired by um, All in Bits, the American company, or the German subsidiary or something, but like, you know, through All in Bits. And, um, and you know, the board had, there was Ethan and Bucky was on the board. Uh, so, you know, so Ethan Buckman, from who's an informal today, and Jay Kwan were on the board. And then I think some sort of Swiss, you know, lawyer, legal person who was not super clued in. Uh, and it ended up being the case that I think the two of them kind of stopped, um, you know, sh they struggled to, it was a little blocked, right? Like they, they struggled to work together. So they were like, okay, let's expand the board and uh, hopefully that's going to help with that. So, uh, me and another person called Fernando Pedone, who's a computer science professor in Switzerland. So we both joined the board of the ICF. So I've been on the board since, um, yeah, for about three and a half years and, um, and the Jay left soon after because he was like, yeah. So yeah, he he decided to step down. And then since then, uh, you know, it's been mostly three of us. Briefly, have we had another person Tess on the board? And uh, yeah, and then more recently, like uh, just a few months ago, um, basically Bucky and I sort of switched roles, and I took over as president, and he's he's still on the board, and he's like the uh, vice president. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of me and the thing the things that keep me busy. That that's a lot, and not, not to mention that also that you're also on the board of the, the Urban Foundation. Yeah, uh, I'm also board of the well. Foundation. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of hats, man. It's a lot of hats. Uh, no, yeah. well, you know, one thing that that's interesting here, and I've I've kind of thought about over the years is, uh, and, and I think what, what a lot of people don't realize is, you've been involved with a lot of projects like sort of early on and like close to inception. Like so, um, you know, earlier. Uh, you, when you first got in, interested in crypto, like you founded this Bitcoin Meetups Berlin group, which I, I think in a lot of ways kind of seeded a lot of the a lot of the that Berlin uh, crypto community that you know became so strong and you know remains like a very central hub for crypto in Europe. And you know, like your involvement sort of that with that meetup, I think uh, helped um, uh, help seed that that initial community. Uh, then, you know, you were also involved like earlier with Ethereum, setting up um, some of the organizations in Germany and uh, helping set up the, the, the German office of Ethereum. Sort of, again, you know, operating in the background, but, you know, still like 
um, contributing to those projects. And then similarly with, you know, with Monax and what was previously uh, Aris Industries, uh, you know, involved with, with some of the organizational work around like building these early versions of, of, um, of proof of stake blockchains that eventually ca became Tendermint. I think a lot of people don't realize like the, the impact that, that Aris Industries had. I mean, also Rick, Rick Dudley was there and, mm -hmm. you know, um, like that company sort of like faded into in, in existence, but like those early ideas seeded a lot of the ideas of you know, that we all take for granted now, like proof of stake blockchains and stuff. So yeah, you've, you've, you've been very like, you know, beyond your role at Epicenter and everything like uh, sort of operating uh, at, at different levels of, of these like early projects that have become massive. And so, yeah, I, 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 I sometimes say that to people and then, oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well yeah, and I mean, maybe sort of like a little bit of a funny, interesting anecdote regarding the Monax Ares. So yeah, it's confusing because it was called Ares Industries and it was renamed to Monax. But the, the so so that company was like building on Tendermint at the time and, and implementing their own EVM. And this was like, it was like a single code base, right? Because it was Jay and then some Ares Industries engineers, mainly Ethan, I think, um, were, were writing this together. And so I think at some point they started, and, and the thing is like Jay is somebody who is, I think, pretty aware and thinks a lot about licensing, law, IP, things like that. And then Ares Industries was two of the founders were lawyers. So they were like very thinking about that too. And, you know, that ended up being some big conflict of like who owns what, who owns, controls what of this code base. And then this sort of solution that they ended up with was that they would kind of segment this code apart and say like, okay, there's like the consensus layer and then there's this like interface and then there's the like VM, EVM built on top. And then, you know, there was like the consensus thing was like Tendermint and the other thing was later became part of Hyperledger. But anyway, it was like, um, bar, you know, had some different names, but that was basically owned by Ares Industries. So this thing that became kind of like a key thing for Cosmos as well around this separation between the you know the consensus and the application on top was, yeah, I think to a significant extent also driven by this, uh, you know, that kind of heiress industry involvement with, uh, you know, building the original kind of tenement code base. Yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to someone like writing a book about the history of Cosmos and like all of these things. <laughs> you know, Zaki's early involvement as well. And so yeah, yeah let's hope let's hope this hopefully thing Camilla becomes... Russo will write this book someday. Or let's hope this whole shit. thing becomes like big and important enough that people <laughs> to will, book, will yeah. actually want to do that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, before not we talk quite about there chorus, yet. <laughs> yeah, no. But before we talk about chorus and all this stuff, like you you mentioned this earlier, uh, you said that the people should be taking their notes in Obsidian. Um, so other people have told me about this this software. At least I've tried to send me notes in Obsidian, and and I, I didn't really like pay much attention to it until now. But like, what is Obsidian, and why should I be using it? Right. I mean, Obsidian is basically like just a note note taking software, and uh, you know, you, know you, you can like write your notes Yet in there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yet another note-taking software. It does have these kind of bi-directional links. Maybe some people are familiar with that. It's basically like, you know, I'm going to, like, I have daily note, and I write in this daily note that you put, like, this kind of, like, square brackets, square brackets, and I put, like, I don't know, ICF, for example. And then I can click on that, and then when it goes to ICF, it will show, like, all of the places where this was mentioned, right? So I think one of the sort of promises of that is that you can, you know, you can... Um, take notes and then uh, later link them together, right? And later kind of recognize the connections and stuff. I mean, I'm someone who's always taking lots of notes. I have like thousands of Evernote, for example, that it just lost in the void, right? Like there's all these notes, never access them, never reread them. And, and so I think one thing is that Obsidian is something that, you know, is like very much geared for this linking of no notes and like building up knowledge over time. So one one way that people phrase it sometimes is your personal like knowledge management where you kind of build your own Wikipedia of like everything you come across all the ideas. Uh, the thing that's also nice about Obsidian is that it's it runs locally on your computer, and the everything is Markdown files. It's basically just a Markdown editor. So in the end, you will have like you know a folder on your computer, and there all of the Obsidian notes are all in Markdown. You could just edit them in any Markdown editor too, 
Um, so it feels like, you know, it feels like you have much more like ownership and control over it than with, you know, Evernote or, or, or like Rome or Notion. offers. And, uh, yeah. And, um, I, I would say I've been interested in this kind of your productivity thing for a long time. I also, yeah. Use the, yeah and, and so this, this feels like, uh, you know, really great for it. It's super flexible and powerful. And then. More. Does it work well in teams or because I'm always thinking about like, how does this integrate? In yeah, my team? yeah. So that is a great question. I think right now the answer, see, like, I think it should, right? I, I think absolutely you should be able to like run entire teams on a tool like this. I think it, my, so my intuition is like, that is the future. Hmm. However, I think the way it's built to mostly use is more as, a, as like a personal system. Yeah. yeah. And I, I did actually tweet the other day. It was like, hey, is anybody doing like team things on there? <clears throat> um, I think what Obsidian also does is you can write plugins for Obsidian. So hmm. you, they were like, and anyone can write. So there's loads of plugins, right? So you can. So I think it is, for example, also a system that, you know, you could take and you could say, okay, I'm going to like, as a company, we're going to like build on top of this thing and modify and develop it um so I, I yeah i don't think there's much team stuff yet but i expect that i i think this is going to become uh used a, a lot by teams as well cool yeah i'm gonna try this out um and i i not to make this a whole like productivity podcast but uh you've already always had some good productivity hacks uh you 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 tweeted this thing about the second brain course that you're taking and this i booked very, it. yeah yeah that's so that's so, okay, so the second brain is basically kind of like a concept that you want to build like an external system where you keep track of all, but you know, you capture all your ideas and projects and notes, and then you kind of organize them in some way. You try to organize them around, you know, projects or like outcomes that you want to achieve in the world, you know, like actions you're going to take. And, you know, that you basically build this one system, right, where you could like, Every, keep track of everything. And yeah, like GTD is the, 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 the kind of the idea with GTD is. It's pretty similar. It's yeah. ca- it's pretty similar to GTD. I mean, I've spent <clears> a lot of time like you know working with GTD, learning GTD, and stuff like that. Uh, I've always kind of struggled with GTD, and I feel Same. like the second brain approach. Uh, I feel it doesn't have the same issues as GTD, so I'm pretty optimistic. Uh, that's going to work. And, and, and you can think of sort of the second brain is almost like, if you think of like obsidian, you say, okay, I'm going to use this obsidian thing. And then the second brain is kind of an answer of like, okay, how should you organize this entire thing? How should you set up this thing? Like what is the kind of the, yeah. And, and I'm sure people can use obsidian in many different ways. And yeah. people also use, do the kind of second brain implementation with different tools right so people will use notion or or, or obsidian yeah, and, and i think or whatever like yeah i think the yeah so i'm um i'm kind of using at the moment obsidian to implement this second brain thing and i'm, I'm really enjoying it i'm having fun with it so and i, I feel yeah. like it feels something that um you know can have a big impact on productivity and creativity i think I think one of the big promises is that you have an idea now, and then it's like, oh, what do I do with this idea? How can I develop this idea? But if you have like a system, you can like put your ideas in there and develop them over time. Um, that feels like very cool. Hmm. And uh, and maybe like a final thing that seems kind of interesting here is if you let's say you use this obsidian and you really like capture everything, and you know, including you have like plugins where now if I have like Kindle highlights and stuff, everything, it goes into Obsidian automatically and so. So if you now imagine over time, like all of the things that you come across, the ideas, the things you read, you highlight, like they go into this Obsidian thing. I think if you in the future have like an AI, an LLM model or AI that's like to support you, I mean, it is going to be perfect for that, right? Because all of your data is going to be right there in plain text, uh, yeah, easily and just. So it feels like I mean, you could all you you could all, all you could already build this, right? I mean, like you could all already have like a local LLM running and 
um yeah yeah you could probably have local llm running like ingest obsidian like obsidian so yeah i think i think that's going to be very cool and i think there's going to be a lot of uh yeah things people are going to do in this direction and it feels like if you think of like sort of ai proving yourself this seems like a great investment to set yourself up right by basically trying to really capture and organize the things in your mind in an external system that in in one in one organized external place cool uh well i I, i'd love to talk more about this but (laughs) probably uh but yeah i'm sure i'm sure i'm sure people listening are also interested in productivity hacks so um uh, what's that course called second brain it's called building a second brain okay yeah I'll, i'll link to it in the show notes Cool. Well, you know, let's um, let's talk about uh, let's talk about chorus one and, and staking a little bit. Um, you know, so Cor- chorus has been through. Yeah, uh, chorus was founded in twenty eighteen, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, chorus has been through like lots of phases. I, I feel like m- myself l- looking outward into into chorus one. You know, so you guys obviously like started doing staking networks and and uh, and taking like delegations from from users. And then building out that staking infrastructure, you guys have done a lot of development work also for uh, other ecosystems. So, you, like you, you've built software like in Solana and Celo, uh, you've done s- software for Axelar, and so like a lot of sort of co- co-development right of software with with those teams. Um, you guys are also doing investments, like you have an investment team uh, that that does like VC investments and projects. Now with this. Uh, Urbit uh, initiative. So like Chorus is, is doing a lot of things um, uh, in addition to like this white label institutional staking. Um, yeah. Like what's the, what's the strategy of the, of the, of the company moving forward and you know, what are, what's the kind of focus for, for the company in the next like five to 10 years and like what areas are you really looking at building out? Yeah. Uh, we have, uh, we have done a lot of different things. Um but I think today I actually feels like we're pretty focused and clear, even though maybe there's still a whole bunch of different activities that fall underneath this uh, direction. But I would say on a high level, it's just our you know thesis is that um, a lot of the world's economy and kind of human coordination, collaboration, creation is going to operate on decentralized networks and uh, using decentralized protocols. And uh, then you need to have infrastructure that, you know, operates all this, facilitate all this, you know, executes all these transactions, verifies them, creates those blocks or or, orders them. And, you know, this is where we're focused on, right? Where we want to, you know, be one of the main companies that sort of facilitates this and enables this, you know, new, more free, open, dynamic uh, economy. So that's that. That's our focus. So, you know, it's mainly that it means we run proof of stake networks, but of course there's, you know, there's other things, right? So there's uh, the MEV work we're doing around that. Um, and MEV is really something where you kind of get a little bit more in depth and you, you, you know, you sort of look at this, the role that the, the validator has and how you can do it better, more optimally and uh, in a way that generates higher revenues. Um, and then, you know, of course there's other things like, you know, operating uh, Oracle networks or, and, and a lot of effort from us has been, I would say also on Ethereum. So building a great Ethereum staking product, which, um, you know, which you can find, uh, it's called Opus. It's, you know, it's live now. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, check it out on our website. Um, and, uh, and then working with institutions. So, you know, working with custodians and, uh, different types of institutions that are like all integrating crypto custody and staking into, uh, lots of different products. So that's also a big focus for us. And yeah, we do have some other things like we do have, uh, we do, uh, venture investments too. We've actually invested in a lot of different Cosmos projects, um, and uh, Cosmos definitely been probably our number one uh, area of uh, focus on the investment side. What's the um, what's your investment thesis with uh, with Chorus uh, One Ventures? Yeah, I mean, we had sort of defined a few uh, verticals that we would look at. So you know, one was kind of like proof of stake. 
So things around, so that either proof of stake networks, or we've invested in things around proof of stake as well, like, you know, liquid staking protocols, or, you know, we in, uh, invested in like, rated, for example, like some data things around it. Um, and then, you know, we also had a focus on middleware. So basically looking at some of these protocols that, you know, kind of sit in between, you know, maybe like the gra indexing protocols and things like that. Um, so those are, those have been, uh, some of our focus areas. Um, Urbit has also been a bit of, um, so we've also made quite a few investments in the Urbit ecosystem. Um, and, and yeah, interoperability is, is, a, is another area where we've, you know, we've been, um, reasonably involved and active in for a long time and, and made a bunch of investments there. I mean, are, is the thesis, uh, to some extent, like interchain aligned, or um, because you you guys have done a lot of investments in Cosmos and or, yeah, or is I mean, it broader I, than that, yeah. I, I would say our overall uh, sort of hypothesis is definitely that we are going to see, uh, you know, that we'll have lots of different proof of stake networks, and I think you said here that they're like sovereign and interoperable definitely is, is our thesis, right? So I think a lot of um, investments do kind of reflect that in that, you know, we invest in different proof of stake networks, app chains, um, yeah. And then things that help them work well together. Yeah. So I, I wanted to actually talk a little bit about interoperability. Maybe this is a good good uh, moment to, to, to talk about it. So like, uh, I, I was talking with uh, Bo Du of, of Polymer like a couple of months ago, and I also did a, an interview with Sergey uh, of Axelar and, you know, coming to terms with like those very different approaches. Right. And I think like when, when I, when I talked to Bo, I, it kind of became clear what those two approaches were, uh, were aiming for. And, you know, with IBC, you know, the idea is to build a standard, like build a protocol upon which you can build applications and, and that protocol is like an open standard in the same way that SMTP is an open standard and that people have built, um, mail, you know, different clients on top of SMTP and have built entire businesses like Gmail, et cetera. Um, whereas the Axelar approach is, is more, uh, although it is a decentralized network, it's more of a proprietary solution where Axelar um, builds the software to, to, to allow chains to interoperate, but it's not... Um, uh, it's not meant to be an open standard in the same way that IBC is, or at least it doesn't, I don't, I don't think it is mm -hmm. um, from, from the same sort of like semantic perspective. Yeah. Can you describe like in your view, how you see these two opposing views or are they opposing, right? Or, or are they sort of like touching at the same idea? And um, yeah, what, yeah, what's the, um, for me, I, I feel like, like the Axelar approach, um, although it scales really well, maybe it doesn't allow for the same sort of permissionless innovation as you, you can get with IBC or like other fully open standards. Yeah. I mean, so, okay. I will try to answer this now. I do want to say that I'm kind of, I hope I do not misrepresent uh, anything here. So, um, I mean, the way I would understand this on a high level, and then, you know, we, we did do some work that's like a little bit related to this. At one point we were working on an, um, a call, like a cello cosmos IBC bridge. Right. And I think this may, may illustrate this to some extent. Um, IBC is, you know, is great because it's very trustless and, you know, you, you just need a relayer who basically is picks up the transaction on one chain, puts it in the other chain, and uh, you don't need to trust this relayer. It could be like anyone. You just need somebody to do it. I mean, theoretically, you could like do it yourself, but of course, like, you know, you'll rely on someone to do that, but you don't really trust them. They cannot run away with your money. And, uh, and you know, that's really great. The downside, of course, is that somebody has to verify, uh, you know, did this token transfer happen? And in the IBC case, you use a live client for that. And the challenge is with a light client, well, like, let's say now, how do you have a Cosmos light client in Celo? And I was like, well, I mean, you could write it in Solidity, which is, for example, what we did, right? Now, the problem is that's like very, it's a huge amount of gas that costs. It's like very, it's a lot of development effort. It's complex. So the Axelar solution 
is basically that they say, hey, we are going to have a bunch of nodes that are going to run uh, a bunch of validators or sort of operators that are going to run full nodes on you know, both chains. And then they can observe what happens on like Celo. And then they just say, hey, this happened on Celo and on Cosmos. And then Cosmos is like, OK, cool. Uh, and uh, and of course, the advantage is you don't need to build light clients. It's like the, the whole development aspect is like way, way less complicated. And it's more flexible, right? You can say, hey, you're going to do it with Bitcoin because they can run Bitcoin full nodes, but you're not going to build a Bitcoin. You're not going to build a Cosmos light client into Bitcoin, right? That's uh, probably impossible or at least extremely hard. Um, so I think Axelar has the advantage that it's more, much more flexible, and uh, but then has a disadvantage that it's not as trustless. Uh, because you're basically trusting like a set of, you know, you have a set, set of entities and, you know, the majority of them need to be honest, but like if they all colluded, they could maybe st steal money, right? Um, and I think we can kind of see also different places. So for example, and now, now of course the challenge is if you want to, if you want to add your chain to Axelar, you're going to have to go to the Axelar network and you have to say, Hey, uh, you guys need to start running nodes from my chain. And they have to say, Oh, is this economically worthy or not? And maybe they're not going to do it. Whereas with IBC, you know, you can just connect. And if there's like someone relaying, it's like, it's cool, right? Like you don't need to get anyone's permission. So I think for example, if you see in the cosmos ecosystem, IBC supported out of the box. IBC is great, right? Like, and, and there's not much, um, it doesn't seem like there's much value uh, for Axelar to add. But then when you come to, you know, bridging across heterogeneous ecosystems, then it's sort of like Axelar approach um, seems, like, uh, seems like a good solution, attractive solution. Of course, there are also other teams, right, that are working more on sort of, you know, extend. And, and Axelar, of course, is itself an I, a Cosmos chain and can itself use IBC to connect to any other Cosmos chains. And and they also have this Axelar VM, right, where you now can write applications on top of it uh, that use this kind of interoperability primitives. Uh, and then I think you have other teams, right, that are also working on kind of uh, using IBC to bridge to all the ecosystems. And um, I think, you know, two that come to mind here is like Polymer and that you just mentioned and maybe Union. That, uh, but I think there's there's a whole bunch more. And um, yeah, and then, you know, there's different trust assumptions. I think some are trying to use maybe ZK technology, um, ZK like clients and stuff like that, which I'm not like super familiar with. But I think the idea here is that hopefully you could get to something that's like as trustless as IBC, but that may, maybe still makes it, you know, gas efficient and light and easier to support than, uh, than the current, the current uh, more like maybe a bit more like Axlar from that sense in terms of the ease of adding new chains. But yeah. Yeah. I think, I think the, the overlying, oh, like the, 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 the underlying idea here is that, you know, we have there's there's one approach that aims to like, create a standard upon which uh, anybody can build. Like so, so, it's a trustless standard. And so, for for example, you know, if you have if you have like IBC between uh, like a Cosmos chain and say like some heterogeneous ecosystem like Ethereum, um, anyone can sort of build the zk technology to do that. Now, there might be different approaches to do that. There might be like. Um, uh, there, there would be different approaches to that, uh, right? If you want to like be efficient, uh, have more gas efficiency, etc. Whereas, like the Axelar approach takes more takes a more efficient approach, um, but you do need to rely on the Axelar network, and so you have to sort of like reason with the trust assumptions there, reason with the possible censorship, um, reason with you know possible like sanctions enforcements and this sort of thing. Um, but I do, I, yeah, I, I think that's sort of the way I see it. I wonder if that like resonates with you. Yeah, no, I think that sounds uh, sounds good. Um, yeah, I mean, so you, you gave a talk at Nebular about the about the staking economy that I thought was really good because it kind of like looks at the entirety of the, the, the staking landscape and breaks down like the different components of it. So if anybody's like looking at getting a, a very high level view and understanding of the staking economy, you should definitely check out Brian's talk at Nebular. It's on the channel. Um, so one of the things that you talked about here was 
uh, the staking landscape between Cosmos and Ethereum. And uh, one of the unique things about Cosmos is this, uh, this you know, governance, right? That like doesn't exist, uh, at least on the Ethereum layer one, um, with regards to the fact that like people can, uh, on Cosmos chains can vote with their tokens. Um, yeah, how, how, how do you see those two things being like different? And do you, you know, do we end up in a, you know, as liquid staking becomes more, uh, more prevalent and more used in Cosmos, like currently there's a huge disparity between like the amount of tokens that are liquid staked in Ethereum versus Cosmos. Um, do you think that as liquid staking tokens, uh, as liquid staking becomes more prevalent in Cosmos chains, that there's a risk that liquid staking becomes a way to set like that ends up centralizing governance, uh, centralizes um, uh, the control of those tokens essentially in, in those liquid staking protocols. Like, yeah, walk, walk us through the, how we should look at the risks here. Right, right. Yeah, so I think this is that is an interesting uh, topic. So, I basically, I think mean, what you have in Ethereum, right? In Ethereum, you say you don't have delegation, but like. If you look at the Ethereum uh, block explorer, you know, you see all these validators and, and there's just a number and you don't really know who runs this, who doesn't. Uh, it's like very anonymous. As an ETH holder, you're not really, you know, you, you're influenced sort of on who is doing all this work. It's like very limited. I mean, you can, you can stake sort of your own ETH in some way. Uh, and I think as a result... The, the equilibrium, the game theoretic equilibrium there is, you know, kind of, and, and this is, I guess, where the MEV topic comes in, because I think that's probably one of the key topics uh, in sort of the differences here, is that, you know, the equilibrium is like, you know, maximum extraction, right? Like you try to just get as much money out of these blocks uh, as you can. And uh, and that's not a bad idea, right? It's not it's not a bad direction, right? It's just this like hyper-efficiency thing. Now, when you look at Cosmos, uh, Cosmos is a very different uh, staking environment, a very different uh, design, right? Because in Cosmos, the validators, they get uh, sort of their spot by the token holders and the token, and, and, and you can see everything they're doing on chain, right? So now if you have a blockchain, uh, the validators are not likely going to do something that seems sort of, you know, maybe undermine the attractiveness of the applications built on that blockchain um, by like, you know, maybe front running everyone and, uh, you know, taking some of their money away when they're trying to trade. All right. So you have, you have this, uh, and, and it's just, it's a system where it's much, there's much more governance. There, there is governance, right. In the cosmos chains explicitly. So people can say, Hey, we are going to go in a different direction. We're going to change some rules. We're going to, you know, slash this person, slash that person, mint new tokens. So that's, you know, down ups and downsides, right? Like I think the upside is that the Cosmos networks are pretty like reactive and will be able to change course, pivot, you know, more easily. Whereas Ethereum has always been this kind of governance minimized approach where they're basically saying, hey, there's like no explicit governance. Governance is this, you know, obscure, long-winded process happening on ETH research forum, long discussions, you know, it's rough. Hard for yeah. So it, now when you take the liquid staking topic, now if you have liquid staking on Ethereum, um, like let's say Lido, for example, uh, has now a lot of stake and Lido has a governance token, right? Lido has this kind of governance system. So now, of course, the concern for, could be even if you're on Ethereum, you're like, hey, actually, we wanted to do to have this neutral protocol uh, and we don't want this governance layer. And now we have like Lido coming in and they have a lot of market share and they have a governance system. So, you know, isn't that threatening uh, the network? Now, of course, the, the, the response from Lido there is, well, we are going to turn Lido in something that's governance minimized and more decentralized to basically be kind of in line with the Ethereum philosophy. So, but I think, I think their yeah, liquid staking is obviously seen by various people in the Ethereum industry as a, you know, as a, as a sort of threat to a kind of governance capture for Ethereum. I don't really agree with I'm not, I would say I'm not overly worried about that. I think the Lido community is very aligned and I think they are going to 
design this in a way that a sort of minimal interference way, because if they're not, they just also risk uh, getting um, getting community against them and getting dethroned. On the Cosmos side, I mean, f- first of all, liquid staking is obviously way, way smaller, right? On on uh, Ethereum, I think it's something like 30% maybe of the um, uh, staked ETH is uh, through Lido and maybe some through other liquid staking protocol. So it's, it's, it's a very large percentage. The reason for this is mainly because there's no delegation, because Ethereum designed staking in a way that's like not user friendly for a long time, you know, you could stake, you could not unstake. So the only way to kind of keep some control uh, liquidity was stake through a liquid staking protocol. So you have a, a liquid staked asset. So th- I think that led to liquid staking being so huge on Ethereum on Cosmos. Staking is just it, it. So by default, it works and it's easy, right? Like you just go in your Kepler and you delegate. You stake, choose a validator, stake, and you're done, right? So that that I think that has great advantages, right? I think it, it makes it much easier for a new validator to come in, and uh, you know it's easy for people to stake with them. It's very difficult on Ethereum, for example, to build a staking product where. You know, you are now going to stake with your ETH with some validator. Right? That actually is a significant software development effort. Um, so I think Cosmos has a lower barrier to entry for new validators, which I think is great. And uh, now, in terms of liquid staking capture, I mean, first of all, what you don't have in Cosmos as drivers for liquid staking is this poor user experience and limitations. Um, so I think that's um, if you don't have that driver, and then so why would you want to use liquid staking? I mean, okay, on bonding period you don't have to wait two weeks, three weeks. It's it's not really enough, I think, for most people to say, hey, I'm going to switch. So I think the main benefit for liquid staking on on Cosmos is going to be if people want to reuse their collateral in some way, right? So they're staking and now they want to do something else. But I think right now, there's just, first of all, a lot of people don't want to do that because that always means layering some risk on top. And uh, most people just don't want to do that. And then the other challenge is, of course, now it's a bear market. There's a very, very little DeFi activity going on. So you, your, your ability to generate extra returns from a liquid staking asset is like very poor. <coughs> also, the, there aren't very many... Um you know, protocols in, in the interchain cosmos space that, you know, allow you to utilize that collateral to borrow against it. I think that's changing. I think there's more and more of those that are coming in. And, and I think that that will probably drive more adoption of liquid staking, but currently. Yeah. 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 Now I think the other question was, is it a big uh, risk for cosmos chains from a sort of governance capture perspective? And I kind of doubt it because Let's say now you have 20% of atoms are held through Stride or something, some liquid staking protocol. I mean, okay, they can, of course, they could start to vote in governance, but I mean, they're probably going to do, I think in the end they will do some, you know, they will do some pass through thing where like, you know, staked atom holders will do the voting. So it should be reasonably aligned. And I think you always have the possibility, right, to for governance on, let's say, the Cosmos Hub to kind of intervene. So, for example, it would be a pretty simple thing, right, to say, hey, uh, liquid staking protocol are not allowed to vote in Cosmos Hub governance. Right? You can just make a governance proposal if people, maybe people majority will agree with it because they feel like, hey, they're actually a threat. And it passes, and then, I don't know, maybe you just blacklist a bunch of addresses that are used by these liquid staking protocols, and they can't vote in the governance, right? So it's hard I to feel enforce, like... no. I mean, because, like, addresses, I mean, people can just, like, move addresses around and make privacy protocols and make, make this harder. I mean, it's not impossible. I, I mean, is, is a liquid staking protocol going to, like, shuffle their coins to try to circumvent the no, they're not, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, so I think the flexibility of Cosmos governance actually means I think it would be easy to react to liquid staking protocols and 
So I, I, yes. I think that risk is pretty low. So something I was thinking about earlier, I was, I was talking to a team today that are, you know, building a pro- a protocol that would allow you to utilize, you know, your, your, your staked assets, um, uh, to as collateral. And, you know, we were talking about this, this, this governance pass through. And, and I had a thought, which was, you know, if you take a step back and look at like Quicksilver and their whole philosophy around governance pass through, it, it's always been clear for them that uh, this was very important that you know, we wanted to give users the ability, well, first to decide which validator they would stake with and, and also which uh, they give them the ability to vote on governance and have full sovereignty over that, which was a very different approach to strides. And, uh, and I wonder how much of that, uh, like, uh, you know, people sort of want, but don't use, right? It's like, yeah, of course, like I, I want more full control over, you know, which validator I'm going to to stake with and, 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 and my governance votes, but actually like most people don't like, don't really take mu- put much consideration into which validator they uh, delegate with, uh, n- nor do they vote on, on governance, right? It's like, um, yeah, so... I- well, I don't know. I feel like in Cosmos, actually, quite a lot of people do sort of um, care about their validator. I mean, of course, yeah, valid. Now, yeah, but... I think I think people in our circles do, but <laughs> I think a lot of, like... Yeah, know, of course, a lot of people don't also. That's, a lot of people don't, true. yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, it, 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 it feels like there's... Um, you know, the search for, for efficiency and here it's like the search for capital efficiency leads you to potential centralization, right? And, and like similarly to this whole interoperability approach, right? The search for efficiency and in, in interoperability leads to, um, you know, more more trust having to be put in this thing, right? So I feel like there's there's sort of like a, a, a tug between, you know, full, uh, full sort of decentralization, um, and some amount of like having to deal with the pain of the, of the inefficiency of that system while at this and the other end, like if you're looking for efficiency, you're going to have some trade-offs that will pull you away from like full decentralization, full rights on governance and like uh, all, all of the, all the nice things that, you know, typically people associate with blockchains. Is, is that something you also see like, and you know, here is the case, like, I think it's also the case with the, in terms of, uh, you know, sequencers, right. For, for L2s where, uh, as we try to um, break up the stack, right, and like have L twos that are fully sovereign from from the L one, well, you come you run into this problem of 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 sequencer centralization, and like as you try to decentralize the sequencer, well, then you introduce like more complexity, um, which might not be desirable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think this is a definitely a big. There's also some sort of a pendulum, right? It goes in one direction. I think there's always pressures towards centralization. There's always pressure towards like, you know, efficiency gains, um, aggregation of things. And then I think there's also pressures the other way, right? Where you say like, okay, now you're going to decentralize this. I think what's interesting on Ethereum, and I, you know, I've been spending a good amount of time on that in the last months to try to understand that, is, you know, how you have really had you know, ended up with a very different model from Cosmos where you have these validators, but actually the validators don't create the blocks. And, you know, there's these block builders that are actually creating the blocks and others like searches that submit transactions and bundles to these block builders. And uh, and then you have relayers. And so you and you have like different types of dynamics and economic incentives on the different levels. Um, so I think, we, you know, we're seeing a lot there. And it's, for example, interesting... Yeah, it's also interesting to ask there, you know, how, it, like, how centralized, decentralized is Ethereum? What do you look at? Do you look at, like, the stake? Or do you look at the block building market? And, um, yeah, I think that's, it, it's just one of the, um, yeah, one of the, one of the sort of perennial um, <laughs> tensions in, in crypto. But I think in the end, I think in the end, you want these protocols to be open and, you know, permissionless and uncensorable, right? And I think if they are, I think the most efficient protocols are going to be like that. And 
and and probably the sort of end state is that you know you need enough decentralization to guarantee those things but you know like you want to balance that with you know having lower cost and higher efficiency and you know speed and throughput and latency yeah can you talk a bit about some of the work you guys are doing on mev uh, of course yeah, sure. So we've been, uh, yeah, I've been interested in MEV for a while. I've done a bunch of work on this. I, I think the, the the work has sort of different flavors. You know, there's more like research work, um, and then there's more like practical work. On the research work, uh, you know, for example, we've been working with DYDX on uh, looking at how MEV should work on DYDX. So DYDX is of course interesting because it's an it's going it's a Cosmos app chain. It's going to be a Cosmos app chain. Uh, they're also using their validators to actually do matching of orders. So they, they're actually taking on some of the functionality from an exchange. And of course, exchanges are the main places where MEV is taking place. So it's like an interesting question of like, okay, how should the chain like DYDX uh, manage this um, and manage MEV? So we wrote kind of, you know, long research report on this, which has been published. So you can check it out. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of these ideas are getting implemented Um when it comes to um, how you know DYDX chain is going to work and how they're going to approach MVV. On the um, on the Ethereum side, we've sort of been doing more like practical work, uh, which has been around optimizing um, MEV rewards. So basically, seeing like you know what are the different things that determine you know how profitable the blocks are that you end up mining when you're the proposer or you end up kind of proposing uh, when it's your turn and uh, you know gathering data and you know we're running now a sort of modified uh, eth client at least on some validators um and you know uh, seeing yeah and, and sort of to to optimize some of the things there and i think that's been really interesting in terms of learning a lot and it's also been great in that we've been able to you know generate higher returns than normal e validators and i think that's uh yeah so that's that's kind of what we're doing there and you know we, we so you're running your own of, ethereum client that, that you guys have built internally i mean it's it's just uh it's the existing client right with a small modification okay and is this open sourced no it's not open source no okay so it's a course one secret sauce. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but but there is a blog post. Um, if you go to the course one blog, and maybe you can link to this, um, that actually goes into a lot of, it's called MEV Matters. Uh, and it goes into a lot of detail on what we're doing there. So I think if people are interested, um, they yeah, can learn a lot about um how we've approached this and, and also about how the whole block, the whole, this whole process works of uh, blocks being produced on Ethereum. And it's, it's a very interesting, I think most people have no idea about this. I mean, even I was fairly clueless about this until not that long ago. I mean, I kind of had some understanding, but it's, um, it's really changed dramatically from the way it used to work in the past and that the way also that other blockchains work. And uh, yeah, what about the, I mean, uh, what, what about the work being done in the Cosmos side of things? Like, um, are you, are you excited about the MEV work that's happening there? Like, you know, from like Skip, for instance, or. Uh, yeah. Mechatech? I mean, we, 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 we do have, uh, we are kind of an advisor to Skip as well. We've been working with them pretty closely, you know, sharing a lot of the research. It's definitely a great team and, um, yeah, I mean, I think cha the challenge a little bit right now is just that there is not, um, there's not, not that much going on. Um, and I think, you know, Skip obviously built their solution for Osmosis, which I think makes a lot of sense, right? They were to just kind of yeah. capture the most uh, most obvious MEV and sort of internalize it in the protocol. Um, and then, you know, I think DYDX is probably going to be the most interesting chains in this regard in Cosmos. Um, but I think it's, I think that, you know, where we sort of arrived at in the DYDX thing is actually that, you know, it's more something that validators are not going to do MEV, you know, like that's kind of the, that the chain basically says, Hey, we don't want validators to do MEV to like, you know, manipulate the order of transactions and all that kind of stuff. And then have, you know, some enforcement mechanisms 
to ensure that that really happens that way. But I, I have actually little doubt that, um, and, and I hope I hope I'm characterizing correctly what where uh, DYDX is ending ended up with. But I think I am, um, and and I think that's really leveraging the advantage of being an app chain and having like delegation and the value of the set that's like accountable in the land of the chain that you can do that kind of thing. And I think it's, that's going to be a very big advantage for app chains over projects building on, you know, Ethereum. Yeah. I mean, so I, I had uh, Magnus on the podcast last week and we talked about this, this block SDK that they, that they built and, uh, yeah, I mean, this this is sort of like what you're what you're what you're hinting at here is is you know re- the the validators are, are not going to have uh, the final say or at least in large part on how the block is built. That will be the application will decide how the block is built, and that's in large part due to ABCI plus plus that now allows this. And the block SDK is a way for the application to dictate to the validator how they will build the block, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that's story. also very interesting as a maybe sort of generalized approach for how this can be done in app chains. Yeah. Yeah. And there there is some work being done on Ethereum here. He, he talked about this this Pepsi uh initiatives, P E P P E P C. I don't know what it stands for, but um I, I've got Okay, my, my I'm, I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah. So it's um yeah, unbundling. I'll put a link to it in the show notes as well. But it's, yeah, this uh this article in Ethereum research. Um Towards protocol enforced proposal commitments, Pepsi. Okay. Uh, which probably takes seven years to roll up, but <laughs> um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I want to talk about the ICF a little bit if you have a bit more time. Um, sure, let's do it. So, yeah, you, you, you just became the, the, the foundation council president. So, I think for for a lot of people in the space and like people in crypto twitter and like you know, the broader community in cosmos i feel like a lot of people don't necessarily understand what is the icf like just organizationally you know like how many people are there and like you know i think a lot of people see the icf as this kind of massive organization you know with like tons of resources etc and that may be true but uh, we'll we'll find out here right. um but then but then also like its role and its mandate and also the fact that it has, you know, these, uh, that it is a Swiss foundation and, and it has a sort of legal framework around it. So maybe un- unpack all that for people and may- maybe paint a, p- a-, a clear picture of just what the ICF is and what its role is. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, so I mentioned earlier, right, basically the ICF was like set up in the beginning in Switzerland as a Swiss foundation. Swiss foundation means it's a nonprofit. <laughs> it doesn't have any owners, right? That organization, um, but it has a sort of a mandate. Owned by you know, Swiss it has, people. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I don't think it's owned by the Swiss people either. It's basically, it's just, it's basically uh, uh, an organization with assets and with a particular sort of mandate for what to do with those assets. And it can use those assets, you know, as long as it's within that mandate. And then there's a Swiss supervisory body that will like, you know, do audits and check that that's actually being done. And, you know, the mandate is, it's kind of broad in some way, you know, it's just like foster decentralized technologies and, uh, you know, sovereign, uh, I, I don't remember exactly, but, you know, basically on a high level, you know, support a Cosmos ecosystem network, sovereign blockchains, uh, interoperability. And um, yeah, that's basically what the ICF, uh, you know, that's what it is and what it what it, its mandate is. Um, the current, you know, currently, I think the ICF has a bit less than, uh, you know, it's something like 270 million uh, Swiss francs in assets or dollar, no, that's dollars. 270 million dollars in assets and you know that mostly derives from the atoms that the um, you know the foundation originally received when it was set up and and also to some extent from the bitcoin and eth that was uh, gotten in the uh, the fundraiser there and uh, you know it basically has this uh, these funds to use for that purpose and uh, the main thing that the foundation does is the foundation funds Cosmos development. So the foundation does have its own team. So it has, you know, some operations, finance team. It has a team around marketing and communications. And then it has an IBC team. 
right? That's that, that's doing IBC Go, um, developing IBC Go, and um, but 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 the vast majority of the budget goes to other organizations that are building you know open source software uh, around the Cosmos ecosystem. So these are things like you know Comet BFT, you know sort of the the uh, tendermint or the consensus uh, Comet BFT. Uh, it's IBC, you know, where the ICF funds a variety of different organizations. It's a Cosmos SDK. It's um, the um, Cosmos Hub work, you know, around like interchange security, things like that. Uh, it's also like Cosmosm to some extent. So, um, yeah, so the ICF basically like funds these different teams to build that work that then ends up being, you know, open source and, uh, so yeah, so I think the the, Cosmo, the ICF is definitely the main uh, funding entity for uh, for all of these uh, efforts, um, and then you have a variety of different companies. Like uh, some example are Informal Systems. So, so the company Ethan started. There is um, you know um, Binary Builders that was sort of spun out. Actually, those people mostly used to be at the at the subsidiary of the ICF and kind of spun out yeah. into their own thing. Um, Marco and Onu are a bunch of others that are doing Cosmos SDK, and they are also running something called the Builders Program, uh, which is also funded by the ICF. The Builders Program is basically like a program where people can go to if they like they want to spin up their own Cosmos SDK chain, and they want help. You know, they want to help figure out tokenomics and legal setup and you know strategy. So the binary builders is kind of a, or the builders program is something that uh, supports those um, those people. Tries to get new chain into the cosmos. Um, yeah, and that's kind of what the the ICF basically does, right? The main thing is uh, fund these things in the cosmos ecosystem, you know, to to move things forward and to also make sure that you know even in the bear market, right, things uh, things keep getting built and the technology keeps progressing. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's um, that that's pretty clear. And I think, uh, yeah, maybe what what are some of the things that you think uh, people get wrong about the ICF? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the thing that people uh, the thing where it gets a little bit tricky is that you know if you if you look at these things like. Comet, BFT, Cosmos. I mean, the, these are very complex projects, and um, there are teams that are driving this that are generally like outside of the ICF. And of course, if if you compare the ICF with other foundations, right? With like, let's say something like, um, I don't know, Ethereum Foundation or like many other foundations, they are very, they they have a much more that also the roadmap and the direction it gets driven by the foundation. And I think at the ICF, it's just the case that all the people doing that kind of work ended up, uh, it, you know, they kind of left early on and went to the, start different organizations in this Cosmos ecosystem. So I think often people sort of want the ICF to maybe have this role of, you know, this is the direction, this is where we're going. And this is something that, the ICF is not particularly well set up to do, right? So the ICF, I think, has been very much of a neutral entity. We've never voted in governance. And, you know, we certainly try to participate and contribute to this process of, you know, where should Cosmos go? What should we prioritize? Um, but we're not really set up to drive this. Uh, now, I think it is... It Who is do you think area should take... To should take sorry who do you think should take that role is it i mean because you know we had a twitter spaces this week where we were talking about like vision and sort of like carrying forward the roadmap and everything do you think do you think it would be necessary for at least some organization or like if it's not the icf then maybe another organization or like a group of organizations to to, to take on that role and sort of like directionally leading the space whether it's like the interchain stack in the interchain broadly or even like the cosmos hub yeah i mean i think when it comes to the particular projects we have actually kind of gone in that direction right so where we had you know for example there were like different cosmos sdk teams in different places 
Uh, and, you know, then we were like, okay, no binary builders is like, you know, that's kind of the team that like is the product owner of this and they're driving it forward. And, uh, and I think with the Cosmos Hub, it was a similar thing where there's like actually Cosmos Hub teams in different places. And then we would like, okay, the Cosmos Hub, work that gets funded from the ICF is kind of coordinated primarily and driven by uh, informal systems. So I, I think when it comes to sort of, you know, the technical roadmap and progress, uh, you know, of the Cosmos Hub, at least to the extent that it's getting funded from the ICF, I think that's mostly at uh, informal. And, and I think that definitely has its advantages. But of course, in the end, um, you know, the atom holders will decide, right? As we see in governance votes, right? And and so um, they they can always have their own direction and vision. And, and yeah, I don't have a great answer. Of course, it's 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 a it's a sort of double edged thing, right? On the one hand, you're like, hey, it's great because it's very decentralized, it's open, people can just come, bring up ideas, and uh, and that's great. And at the same time. It helps a lot if there's, you know, someone who's like, this is the direction where we're going and um, gives that kind of clarity and guidance and and it can make things easier. And, and I think that kind of leader Cosmos does not, it, often this is like one person, right, that is the founder of a project and has a huge public stature and they have a very clear vision and the Cosmos doesn't have that. And, you know, that's blessing and a curse. Um I do hope that in the future we will be able to coordinate better in, you know, using governance and on-chain mechanisms to kind of, you know, make decisions, agree on things, deploy funding. Um, but yeah, it's 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 definitely a challenge uh, for sure. Yeah, it, it feels like um, it feels like a challenge. Is very it's it's quite unique to Cosmos, and and I think I mean I'm not entirely sure of this, but I think probably there are other big software projects that you know suffer. Maybe not in crypto, but like I'm thinking about like Linux, for example, like the Linux kernel. I don't know. I think there's like probably a lot of organizations that are driving that. You know, certainly a lot of web technologies, right? There's not like a single organization that's driving the development of HTML and C plus plus and the standards there. It's a consortium of you know, lots of different companies and stakeholders, Google, uh, you know, and like Facebook and like tons of other companies that are part of this W3C consortium. You know, I think for a long time in crypto broadly, we've, we've kind of like talked about whether or not we would need some sort of consortium. Um, you know, this is something we were talking about, I think like five, six years ago, you know, um, that never really materialized, but, you know, I wonder if, 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 if in Cosmos, uh, you know, there would be a benefit since it is very decentralized. And that is, I think, a benefit. I think it, it is a benefit because we get a lots of great ideas. And then also you have like on-chain governance that's, that's, that's a part of that decision process. If, if we would not benefit from having a some, some sort of a formal consortium body, right? Where like people, different stakeholders, teams working, like product owners, et cetera, the ICF token holders can kind of like come together um, and... Um, have a, a, a forum where the vision can be discussed, where like the directionality of the software can be discussed. And then those, those conversations also like feed into governance uh, on yeah. like on-chain governance, forum posts, Twitter spaces, et cetera. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think there's um, definitely, um, definitely, I think a lot of things can be done on, on that front. And I think I, I totally agree. I think that's an important thing. Mm. So now that you've like moved into this role, um, what what areas would you like the ICF to say like uh, in, in, you know improve on, or are there like specific areas of development that you that you're interested in building out at the ICF? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's a bunch of things that are sort of the areas of focus uh, at the moment. I mean, I think one thing is the extension of the Foundation Council. Uh, I, I, yeah, so basically we, we want to add some new people to the Foundation Council and that, that's kind of going on at the moment. We've received quite a lot of applications, uh, you know, a lot of like great applications, you know, at the moment, like going through them, we interviewed some people, we interviewed some more people and I think we'll, you know, we'll soon add a few more people. And I think that that's an important thing. It's been kind of for, for a long time, we're like, hey, we need to do something there. And I think I'm, you know, I'm happy that, that that's kind of 
sh should be happening very soon. Uh, you know, another thing that at the moment's going on uh, that's, uh, you know, high priority is just sort of budget for 2024. So, you know, how, how much is going to get funded for different areas, you know, the organizations that are going to get funded. Uh, so that's something where, you know, the ICF focused on. There's this kind of process where different organizations are trying to give input. And I think that's that's something, yeah, we need to get done. And then in terms of, you know, areas of improvement, I think the, one of the most important ones is that the ICF needs to do a good job at giving out the money it does, right? We want to pay the, an appropriate amount. We don't want to pay too much. We don't want to pay too little. We want to give it to the things that really have the biggest impact. If something's not working, we should stop giving them money. Uh, and I think all of that, that's, that's actually very challenging to do because these are complex software projects. And um, yeah, so I think that improving that is, is, is probably the number one priority so that we can give funding uh, more effectively, better, you know, with more data, more understanding. And uh, we are also looking to hire uh, at the ICF um, for this. So if someone's like super interested in this, uh, you know, reach out. So I think that's that's something that is you know is I would say is one of the most important areas of focus. Um, I think another and then it gets a bit more, um, yeah. Like I would say, I would say another area that there could also be improvements is around the communication, marketing, and communication. And I think the um, you know the ICF could play an important role. And then I think this is also something that came up in the Twitter space as you organize, right? In terms of communicating to other ecosystem, you know, what is the Cosmos SDK? Like, what's the Cosmos vision? Why should we build on Cosmos? Like, how does it work? You know, uh, where should you go? And I think, we, you know, the, that's happening, like, to some extent. But uh, there's no question that I think we could do, like, a much, much better job at that. And I think that's also going to be one area where, you know, it will make sense to, to invest and improve our capabilities. Yeah, you'd be surprised just how many people reach out to me and ask me for an intro to the ICF. And my response is usually like, well, I mean, the ICF, like why? And then they're like, oh, because we want to work in Cosmos. I'm like, well, the ICF is not the right organization to, to talk to directly because they're, you know, you want to be talking to the individual teams. I think yeah. you know, no later than like yesterday, you know, we had, we had another request. And, um, yeah. and, and then, you know, I, I think I think some something useful here would be, you know, at a minimum, maybe like some kind of a cartography of like all the different teams and what the responsibilities are and you know who are the sort of key people and product owners. Um, and then you know maybe to some extent, you know uh, like a um, ecosystem representative or like developer relations representative at the ICF that can like take calls and make introductions because you're you know yeah. always sort of like want to have you know they want to have a call with someone um and sort of yeah, yeah. The, the way to field you know those requests to different places in the space um that feels like you know an easy uh, uh an easy or sort of easy thing to implement right and and um yeah and it would add a lot of value yeah but, no absolutely um, yeah. i think that that uh, could make a lot of sense yeah yeah cool well i mean i'm excited for the future of the interchain uh, with uh, <laughs> with with you at the helm of the foundation council, I think uh, I think uh, you'll do a great uh, you'll do a great job, and like hopefully, um, um, you know, hopefully the ICF. I mean, I I know the ICF will will greatly benefit from from your leadership there, and and of course, like bringing more people also into the foundation council is is really terrific. Like bringing more more ideas and more you know, diverse backgrounds into into the decision making process, and yeah, so. I think we'll end it there. Um, yeah, it's getting really hot in my studio. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, thanks so much for all your work, and I think you've done such a great job too with, like, you know, the I mean, communicating and like just exploring the cosmos ecosystem, bringing the great podcast content here, and and then if you're you know very excited about what you're gonna do with your ventures, cosmos focused, in, interchain focused ventures fund as well. Yeah, I mean, there's no other space I'd want to be spending time in right now so <laughs> so yeah we're we're also very bullish on the interchain and we, we want to yeah we want to like 
share this content with people like so that they understand just how great the tech is and then we also want to invest in great projects that are you know utilizing that tech so cool yeah. all right well thanks right. so much thanks brian